as we turn to 2 Timothy chapter 4. As we're winding this series down, that we just one more week next week, as we wind this series down, as Timothy is, is uh, shared with the Apostle Paul at some point, his challenges, his shortcomings, his, his, um, his difficulty in ministry, Paul is giving him the answers, and we've gone through this book now as, as we look into a life on fire, a life on fire not only for Jesus, but a life on fire for the church, a life on fire for the ministry, a life on fire for the gospel. And so we, we find ourselves in chapter 4, and uh, while you're turning there, let me, let, me, let me just kind of tease you out a little bit. We all have things that we long for. We all have things that we long for. Now, I, you know, when I was a kid, I longed for Christmas. Amen? I didn't care about Easter. I didn't care about anything else. All I knew was Christmas, is the, that's the time. You know, the second, I mean, my birthday was one thing, but Christmas, that was it. You know, I mean, because we, mom and dad, were, we didn't have a lot when I was growing up, but they, they gave us a lot of stuff, and, and it was wonderful how they poured into us. I don't know what it is for you. And, and that was certainly my childhood. That's changed a little bit now, but I don't know. So I threw some things down. Sorry for them being so weak, but I thought, you know, sometimes we just long for ice cream. I mean, let's just put it out there because we all long for ice cream. And if we didn't, there wouldn't be so many ice cream stores. So obviously we long for ice cream. Maybe some of you shopping. <laughs> really one person in the church. <laughs> wow, okay. I mean, everybody else doesn't like to shop. So, okay, what, how about just a vacation? You know, it's like, yeah, Lord, give me a vacation. I'm ready for a vacation. Maybe a, a big, fancy house in the Caribbean. Yeah. Pastor Mike's big dream, you know. Big, fancy house. How about maybe, maybe this might help. I mean, how, you know, we long for no taxes. Yeah. Wow. Well, some, some people like paying taxes, I'm, I'm not one of them. I don't know what it is for you. I don't, I don't know what it is for you, but can you take just take, take 10 seconds and just, just stop for a moment, and, and maybe you need to close your eyes so you're not distracted. What do I long for? The Apostle Paul spent his life on the gospel. The Apostle Paul spent his life, gave his life to Jesus, gave his life for the sake of the gospel. And while Timothy was struggling with ministry, it was not a strange thing for the Apostle Paul. It was something that he was very, very familiar with as well. But Paul wanted to pour into this young preacher and, and, and his, if you will, his protege. And, and so he, he reminds him of his own journey. And in, in this letter... In verse 6, Paul begins to share just briefly as we start this out um, what, what, what Paul was trying to get to him was, was something very profound. He says, Timothy, which he's talking to us as well, for I am already being poured out like a drink offering and the time of my departure is near. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Wow, those are powerful words. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. I, I, I just want to be known for one of those. But then Paul brings in kind of this final secret to the longevity of his ministry to Timothy. He kind of shares with him this ultimate hope, this ultimate desire for eternity. And he says there in verse 8, Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. Just, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. Paul longed for Jesus to come. Now, he didn't get to see that, but Paul longed for that. 
I think it's common for us to speak about Jesus' return. And we, we kind of shrug it off most of the time. Like, uh, you know, Jesus said he was going to come back 2,000 years ago. And like, no, that's not what he said. In fact, he said, no one knows the time. Not even the son. But only the father. So, so Paul may have had his own thoughts or opinions but Jesus didn't give anything about when he was going to come. So Paul wasn't wrong, and yet he wasn't right. But sometimes for you and me, we are 2,000 years away from the Apostle Paul and from Jesus saying, I'm going to come back. Matthew 28, at the very end, lo, I'll be with you always. Hey, I'm going to come back. But 2,000 years passed, we kind of, we kind of shrug it off now. Almost kind of make fun about it. And almost as if it's just, you know, it's just, it's, it's more fantasy than it is real reality. Or, or maybe it's just more mythology. Like, is Jesus really going to come? I had a, a pastor friend tell me one time, after he told me this, I wasn't sure if I was his friend anymore. But he said, he said I just don't know that, that the return of Jesus is anything real. I think that when we die, that's Jesus' return. And I, I just could not get my mind around what he was saying. Because I just didn't, I, I can't believe that. It, because if you throw, if you throw it out, the, the God's word out that Jesus isn't going to return, then, then you've got to throw the whole word out. If something not be true, then, then none of it's true, Really? And so I just struggled with that and I had the, had the greatest difficulty. I, I mean, it just it, it hit me so wrong. But, but in fairness, I'm not exactly sure that me or we you know, give a whole lot of credence to Jesus coming back. Because if it did, I think we would change some of what the way we live. I mean, there's a reason that Paul sits in these three verses, I'm being poured out like a drink offering. My departure's near. I fought the good fight. I finished the race. I've kept the faith. I have longed for his appearing. There's something special about this. Something that we need to maybe incorporate a little deeper into our life. Because when we do, I think it changes some things. It orients some things, some perspectives, some ways of living that we might just, that we might just change and, and it will transform us. When Paul said, I fought the good fight, he was saying, I gave it my all. I gave everything. I, 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 did, I put myself all out there for the gospel. I fought the good fight. I finished the race, and if you remember the, the, me talking about this not too long ago, I was talking about you ran the race with integrity. You didn't make shortcuts. You didn't take shortcuts. you got to run the track. You can't cut through the infield. You can't make a corner cut, or, or there's no integrity, and you didn't run the race right. Paul said, when he's saying this statement, he's saying, I ran it with integrity, the true track. I ran it completely. I didn't cut corners, but I'm here to tell you, the church, I've cut some corners. I've cut some corners. I know you have too. We all have. Paul's saying, he's not denying that he probably didn't cut some corners, but he's saying, I ran the race. All that is required. And I've kept the faith. And I, right there, if we could just, just anchor in on that, I have kept the faith. Live as Jesus commanded. Live as Jesus wanted. What great words I have fought. I have finished, I have kept. Why? Because Paul had a, had a, bigger, a bigger purpose and he had a, he had a commitment that he, that he knew absolutely to be true that, that it, once again I go back and I remind you of his words when he said to, to Timothy who was talking about, I am, I, I, I am confident. I know whom I have believed. And I am persuaded that he is able to keep me. That which I've committed to him unto that day. That's chapter one. We've already been through that. But you remember those words and the, and the power that they have in there. I know 
whom I believe. I know that I am persuaded that he is able. And so as the world attempts to sweep us away at times and, and sway us and move us and tell me that Jesus really isn't going to come, which I'm sure is happening in Timothy's time, and the apostle jumps in and says, whoa, 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 whoa. Great things are still going to happen because he is going to come. And with that, there's going to be these promises and these blessings, this honest judgment of God. And to all, those are available to all who will long for his appearing. Which begs a question for us today, of course. The question is, is how when we go out living in our lives each and every day, the question how am I living my passion for Jesus' return? We don't think a lot about it. We just simply think about living the Christian life, which is right, but we need to have this longing for Jesus, maybe a little more embedded into who we are, that he is going to come back. There is a point where, we, where, where this is one of those pinnacle moments in life, or it wouldn't have been said so many times over and over and over told the disciples, stay here until I come. And of course, he came on resurrection day. He ascended to the, to the, to the clouds on, on the ascension Sunday, that, that day. And he said, hey, don't forget, I'm coming back. And then the angels even proclaimed it. Hey, don't, why are you looking for the, the living amongst the dead? Why, why, are you, why are you waiting here, standing here looking for Jesus to come back? He, he said he'd come back, go about your business, but don't lose sight of his return. And so when all is said and done in one aspect, when the rubber meets the road, if you will, believing that Jesus is real and alive and, and, and he died and is returning to take us to be with him, that's the essence of real faith. That's the essence of real faith. Listen, I have nothing to offer you today except the gospel of Jesus Christ. Love it, love it. I have nothing. It's simply that Jesus died freely for you and me to be with him. This is the good news. I don't want to make it too complicated, but the bottom line of your faith is just simply that. Jesus died as he said he was going to. He rose again on the third day as he said he was going to. He ascended to the Father as he said he was going to, and he's going to come back as he said he is going to. That's it. That is all I have to offer as a pastor. I was re reading one quote this week from a, from a sage of yesteryear, and he said, the pastor's job is to remind the church you're a Christian. Go live like it. <laughs> I thought, well, those are so such simple words, isn't it? That's all I have, though. That's all any of us have. And so I remind you today that Jesus' words were this. Don't let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. For in my Father's house are many rooms. And if it were not so, I would have told you. But I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back that I will take you to be with me where I'm going to be. I mean, this is, this is a reality. Here's the proclamation. And we cannot forget those words. And so I encourage you today to begin to take heart and to take root in the fact that Jesus is going to come again. And so as, the, as emphatic as the Apostle Paul is here when he's talking to Timothy, he, he doesn't leave us without uh, direction. In fact, he he gives us great direction. And in this passage, as we get to verse 1, go back up to verse 1, he says, Timothy, I give you this charge. What a way to start something. I, I give you this charge. I, I, I need you, Timothy, to, to anchor your life into these things, and here's why. And so he doesn't give us a, a directionist thought of saying, hey, just find yourself you know, in, in, in longing for Jesus, which is really hard to do, to be honest with you. Because we live busy lives. We live, we live complex lives today, far more than any other time in history. But the charge is given, and it's given perfectly. And he starts it out, and he says, In the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, 
in the presence of God and in Christ Jesus, who will judge the living and the dead, and in view of his appearing in his kingdom. I mean, so he says, first off, Timothy, listen to, or saints, listen to you, as if I was talking to you today. Listen to me. I give you this charge. In the presence of God and Jesus as he is here, and the presence of the Holy Spirit, listen to me. Here's the charge. You know the God who's going to judge the living and the dead. I, I want you to know there's accountability to what I'm going to say. And in view of all the kingdom, hear me well. That's what he's trying to tell Timothy. That's, 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 this is what I'm telling you. So, I mean, this is a powerful charge that Paul wants Timothy to, to, to hear and to understand there's accountability. It's not just something that Paul is, is flippantly saying. And it's as if he's sharing the heart attitude of God and his mind set on speaking words of life to this young pastor who's struggling through life. And maybe you're saying, well, I'm not a pastor, but I'm struggling through life. That's it but you're still a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so I, I want to give you the following truths out of, out of the next few verses. And so the first, verse that, or the first truth that I have for you today, pick this up and you write this down. When we speak to others and into the life of others, like Paul speaking to Timothy, speak before the presence of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Speak as if you are in their presence. Why? Because you are. Because you are. We have way too loose of lips today. I mean, we, we say things without even thinking. They just, we've been taught and so well schooled by, by evil and by the demonic. We just simply, we say anything. In fact, some people say what's on their mind too freely. And the reality of that is that there is, there's a, there's, there's a, a chance or a reality that, that you know, we can jump into gossip. We speak words of harshness, death, not life. Deuteronomy long ago tells us in verse 30, or chapter 30, verse 19, it says, the Lord is speaking to the Israelite nation. He says, this day I will call the heavens and the earth as witnesses against you that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. He says, now choose life so that you and your children may live and that you may love the Lord your God. Listen to his voice. Hold fast to him. And then it says, the Lord is your life. Wow. You see, here's the thing. Too often, we speak random, foolish things to people. People we like, people that we just meet, people that we don't like at all. We speak either life or death. You have a choice today to, to change the way that you're going to do life. God said, choose life. Though he told it to the Israelites, he said it to us. Choose life. Choose words of life. Not Choose blessings, not cursings. I mean, here's the thing. It's a lot of work to watch what you say. If you're one of those lucky ones that all you say is sweet things, blessed are you. <laughs> Chances are most of us are not. Most of us don't think when we speak. We just speak. And so often we speak cursing. We speak words of death. So, for the Lord is your life, ends this passage so powerfully and so beautifully, I speak because the Lord is my life. I speak because I'm in the presence of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Listen, if you're, if you're somebody who swears, this will change your life. This will transform you. Because the reality of it is, you're speaking before God. You're speaking before God. You're speaking before Jesus who, who, who took away your, your sin. You're speaking before the Holy Spirit who, who wants you to be transformed. This will change your life. It'll transform the way you speak to all people. People you don't like, people you do like. People that you can't stand, people that you hate. It'll change everything. So what does he say? How does he, how does he unpack this for Timothy? 
Well, now this is where the point you're going to say in verse 2, you say, well, pastor, I don't preach the word. Yes, you do. Every single day, you preach something with your lifestyle. You preach something. You preach blessings, you preach cursings. You preach God's word, you preach secularism. You you preach that I don't believe in God at all. You preach something. He says, verse 2, preach the word. Timothy, here's how you live this out. Proclaim God's word just how it is. Be prepared in season and out of season. Correct, rebuke, and encourage with great patience and careful instruction. Don't forget the Apostle Paul was one of those who killed Christians. And at this time, as his wise wisdom of age begins to to grab onto him, you know that while he wasn't one of the 12 apostles, but he was probably an onlooker at some point, one of those Pharisees scheming against Jesus, scheming against the apostles. Obviously, he watched Stephen be killed. He told them to kill Stephen. And right here, you know, Paul wishes he could just go back and take it all back because he did it so wrong. So the emphasis, the power, the wisdom, preach the word. Live it out. Speak truth. Speak life into people. Not your own opinion, not your own desires. Be prepared in season and out of season. Be ready. Ready yourself. Practice your language. Practice what you're saying. Flee bad language, if I may. Correct and rebuke. Yeah, but do it with with gentleness and patience. Those are the fruit of the Holy Spirit. So, Galatians 5.22, if you need to write that down. Galatians 5.22, because the fruit of the Spirit is, an, is, is, a, is a good list of things that you should be living. But don't, not, not in negativeness. Don't correct the rebuke in negativeness or criticism or, or, or correction. But do it in encouragement. Tell pastors all the time that you, could, you have a choice when you get up on the pulpit that you can preach down to people because there's a whole lot of don't do's in the bible and it's easy to stand up here stand up here and say you're gonna go to hell if you keep sinning the way you're sinning back in the day we used to call it fire and brimstone (laughs) i was never part of that day but that's what we did back in the day and it's easy to say don't do this don't do this if you're gonna be a christian you can't do this you can't do that you can't do this it's hard to be up here and say listen God loves you. You are better than you think you are. Go live it out. Let me show you how to do that. Let me show you how to live it out. And that's what I'm saying here. It's easy to be critical and negative, but but, but the reality of it is better if I say, preach the word because the word of God's in you. If you're a believer today, the Holy Spirit is in you. Go share that with people. Share your journey. Share your life. Share your witness because God's done something good in your life. Go share that. Go share that. Be ready in season and out of season to give the good words of life. Somebody said, when you have opportunities to indulge in the flesh, choose life in the spirit instead. When you desire or feel the desire to avenge yourself, promote yourself, slander someone, or engage in sinful activity, choose life in the spirit instead. Choose to love God and others. Live in step with the Spirit and discover the amazing life He longs to guide you into today. One of the bloggers that I follow, Craig Dennison. Good words, good words. So the apostle tells us, he tells Timothy, why this charge is so vital. And this is the world in which we live today. Verse 3 and 4 says, For the time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, they will suit their own desires. They will, go, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. They will turn their ears away from the truth and turn aside to myths. Point number two, here's my second truth. Myths are easier to believe in because we recognize that truth doesn't allow us to live how we think we want to live. 
myths are easy to live because we, we, we don't, it's a broad, it's a broad, wide open way to live. But the truth of the gospel is narrow. And we don't necessarily like that, to be honest with you. We don't want to live in that narrow lifestyle. We want to be able to live how we want to live, right? I mean, that's just the way we are. And it had to be hard for the Apostle Paul to say this to the church. But it's a reality. When you're following Jesus, we don't always want to hear the, the, the sound truth. We don't always want to hear. We want to hear what we want to hear. And sometimes it's just hard to take in. And so we gather people around us that we, that we, want, that we want us to, we'll, we'll convince them to agree with us. See, 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 see? It's kind of like my friend who said, I just don't think that Jesus really is ever going to return. I think it's just when we die. Like, nah, I don't believe that. I don't buy into that. But that might have been what it said. Hey, Timothy, Jesus hasn't come back yet. Guess your Lord's dead. <laughs> Something like that. Verses like this, which are so, so difficult to deal with, we see it out in the world. We see it in our media. We see it in the platforms, the agendas, the politics. Sometimes it sounds so good. I mean, it's so rational, so right. But in reality, it's not the truth of God. And you've got to test that. You've got to learn to, to, to manage that. The myth is easy to think, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But the truth is, God said it this way. If you want to be one of those who live your life and leads your life, because if you don't lead your life, somebody will lead it with you or for you. Somebody will come alongside and they'll say, hey, no, let's go this way, let's go this way, let's go this way, and they'll lead you astray. If you want to take control of your life, then you're going to have to take control by what, that which is solid. We talked about the wise man that built his house on the rock. You're going to have to do that. You're going to have to center it in your will to say, God, I will not change that which I believe. Jesus said, Father, sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth, and that's all I got. I don't need anything else, but that's all I got. Your word is the truth, Lord. You are correct. So the prayer is for you to stand on firm ground, sound doctrine. That's what Paul is saying. Never let the turning away of the truth by people affect your commitment to the teachings of God. Never let it happen. So how do you live this out? How do we live out this, this idea of, that, of, of myth versus, versus Jesus? Well, listen to what Paul says in verse 5. But you... Timothy, you saint, you believer, keep your head in all situations. Underline that. Keep your head in all situations. Endure hardship. Do the work of the evangelists. Discharge the duties of your ministry. So here's, let me give you the truth and I'll unpack it. The truth is this. The gospel empowers us and encourages us to remain focused out in front of our lives. Now, so, so there's going to be a bit of a tension here with this, but, but let's just unpack this a little bit real quick. Keep your head in all situations, endure hardship, do the work of the evangelist. Well, pastor, I'm not an evangelist. Well, you know, but you've got a witness. I already said that. You've got a witness. We're to be the witness. So be the witness, if you will, and do the job of the ministry. Do, so all of us can do the job of the ministry. Well, I don't really have a ministry. Well, you have something. So you, I mean, you're telling people something. You're showing people something. So really, you have a ministry of some type. Either show them Jesus or show them the world. But you're going to show them something. Hopefully, it's Jesus. Now, so let me, let me just unpack these. Keep your head in all situations. Here's the thing. You're going to have to, you, and you need to know that you have to live out front. If you don't live out front, then you're going to the battle, if you will, with your armor down. And the only thing that you can do when faced by the enemy is react. And sometimes you're not fast enough with the action. Am I right? But when you live out front and you're prepared and you know it's coming, then you're better prepared to do the battle because you're already ready to go. You already knew that which was coming is going to come. Now, as easy as that rolls off my lips, it is super hard, saints. It's a challenge. But that's the, the power the gospel gives us that. It, it empowers us. The gospel empowers us, and it encourages us to live out front, endure hardship, 
We know that that's coming. It's just going to happen. It's going to come against us. If it's not things of life, it's people of life, maybe. Do the work of the evangelist. Be prepared. Know what you're talking about. Know that what you got, you ain't got nothing. You were brought into this world with nothing, and the rest of the cliche will carry itself out. So, you, so you, what you do is you arm yourself at least, at least, with the good news of Jesus. That's all I got. I don't have anything else. Jesus said he's coming back. I believe he's coming back. And here's why I believe that. Because he's spoken to my life, into my heart, and he transformed me. And not me alone, because he's spoken to your life. And, he said, and, I, and you shared that with me. And I'm like, really? God did that? Somebody told me this morning how great it was. They said, they said God gave me a dream. Like, really? I mean, it was a crazy dream that only God could give. I love it. That's how I know. Because he's not just me, but it's also you. And discharge the, the dues of your ministry. Well, you prepare for ministry. You prepare for ministry. You prepare for things that are coming. Things that are, that are going to happen. You, you know, we don't just live and react. We live with, and we kind of plan out a little bit. Live out in front of your lives. Be thinking ahead. What's God going to do tomorrow? How should I plan for tomorrow? I got to go into a horrible meeting tomorrow. Guard yourself. Get ready. Plan ahead. Say, Lord, I know I need you to go with me, but I'm going to go into a horrible meeting tomorrow. So let me outguess this a little bit so I'm ready. But mostly prepare my heart to be girded with the gospel. Well, when you lead your life in your faith in Jesus, the apostle reminds us, and we've come full circle, that there's blessings, that there's faithfulness of God. As long as we continue, he says, to long for his appearing. Now, there is in store for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord Jesus, a righteous judge, will award, but not only to me only, but to all who have longed for his appearing. And so we come out of these helps and these things that will build our faith that we might have and we might nurture this longing for Jesus to come. Well, wait a minute, Pastor. If Jesus comes, then I'm, you know, I'm not going to live life here on earth. Like, I'm going to be gone. Let me help you out with that. Imagine Earth. See, I, I, I spent my formative years in Arizona. Let me help you out. We lived along, Robin and I lived along the Rito River. <laughs> There's no river in Tucson, Arizona. <laughs> it's a sand bed, except for when it, you know, flash floods, and then it's there for, you know, 20 minutes, and then it's gone. And you can go back out there and kick dust again. It's like that, it's that easy. You see, th th I, that to me is what n earth is. Now, don't get, no, you, well, Pastor Mike, God created the heavens and the earth. Yeah, and then sin entered the world. Don't forget that. God created, but God, sin entered the world. Okay, so I kind of judge the earth like living by the rivers in Tucson, Arizona. Dry, boring. And you never see anybody out there on a loungers taking the sun. <laughs> Ever. Never have them. But, but my only other gauge that I have is this, and that's why it was in my notes, is that, that I, I, I love the beautiful blue, crystal blue waters clear in the Caribbean. Oh, my goodness. That's like heaven. It's amazing to go there. Love that place. Casual, comfortable. Like, this is, ah, oh, this is so good. Now, you have to choose your own self, what that imagery for you is like. I am just saying that this looks a lot more like earth. That looks a lot more like heaven. If you want to stay living in Tucson, well, good luck to you. I'm not going there again. Been there, and I've done that. So I don't see the blessing, but I see the blessing over here. 
I get that we are attached to the earth. But God says it's so much greater. I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And it's going to be good. And if he's taken 2,000 years, <laughs> just take that with you today. That's the whole message right there. And all I'm asking you today is, you know, as you think about Paul's words and what you long for, that we long really not only for heaven, but we long for Jesus' return. Our Savior, our Lord, the one who opened heaven for us and who creates heaven for us. So today, maybe you could step a step, take a step towards that today. Maybe you could take a step towards that. I, I need to long for Jesus better. So tonight when you go to bed, that you might make that prayer. Lord Jesus, I, I want to long for you. I want a passion for you and your return. And when you wake up tomorrow morning, you'll be thinking, Lord, I, I'm ready. I'm, gonna, I'm getting ready to go. I just want to remember that you're going to be coming back. That's how much you love me. I know you've taken a lot of steps. Keep taking them. Don't stop. Keep them going. Take your st step to strengthen how you long and want to long for Jesus. But maybe as well, there's a step or two that we also should take. Maybe you're here today and, and you... You're not quite there, but you just want to take a step towards Jesus. And, and maybe you, you, out of the prayer time that we've had and the, the sanctity of that sacred moment that you realize that I, need, I just need to take a step towards Jesus, take the step. Whatever is in your heart, take that step. If it's forgiveness of sin, then just take the step. Lord, forgive me of my sin. If it's the need fill of the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, come in me more. Or maybe you're here today, and, or maybe you're watching this online, and, you, and you've not given yourself to Jesus at all. You're just on the edge. You want in, but you just won't go in. You won't take your foot and step into the water. You just simply want to keep looking. And I'm encouraging today, take the step into Jesus. So whatever that step is today, I want you to, to take that step. I want you to pray, and I'm going to give you that time, that space to seek the Lord and ask him to to help you take that step. So Lord, hear us as we pray. Father, hear us, hear our hearts. As we pray this, we want to be changed, we want to be transformed, we want something different than what we walked into. We want a newness. We want to experience you. And for those who have never taken that step today, I just pray, God, that you would empower them just as to proclaim the, good, the goodness of, your, of who you are. They, they might pray, Lord Jesus, come into my heart today. I want you to be Lord and Savior of my life. I believe, I really do as best I can, believe in your death and in your, in your resurrection from the grave. That you ascended on high and you're coming back. Help me in my faith. Help me in my unbelief. But I confess to you today, I'm a sinner who needs saving. The grace, your grace. I need, I want eternal life. Come into my heart. Whatever you prayed, Father, hear your saints, hear your people. 